Okay, my name is David Eagleman. I'm the editor of the International Journal of Occupational and Environmental Health. We also deal with consumer health issues, and I'm also the uh, a uh, clinical professor of family medicine at Brown University, and do research in a variety of occupational and environmental health areas, particularly in the area of corporate influence on health information. And as editor. I make an effort to solicit articles, particularly from individuals from developing countries who otherwise don't have an opportunity to publish in American or European journals. Well, in occupational environmental medicine, it's critically important that we move towards studying problems and recommending solutions for developing countries because many of the industries that were in existence in Europe and the United States have moved to developing countries. And many of them have moved, but they've forgotten to take some of the control measures with them so that people's exposures in developing countries to some toxins are higher or as high as they were in the United States and Europe a hundred years ago. And that needs to be documented and the journal hopes to participate in that process, and policy recommendations need to be applied in developing countries as they've been applied in the West. We've been trying to encourage articles on the, quote, informal sector. Informal sector exists in developing countries, much less so in the West. Informal sector are workers who work on the street, in vending, or in their homes. In their homes, just because it's in their house doesn't mean it's not potentially a dangerous situation. Sometimes it's much more dangerous. For example, in many countries, people at home with their families around are melting lead and reconstructing auto batteries. Others are working at home stitching clothing for Western use. And these operations are going on unregulated, unmonitored, and uncounted. And we think that there needs to be more research focused on those areas, and we're going to try to encourage the publication of articles in that area in a call for papers that's going out this month. The scope is the globe, and we try, and we're trying as hard as we can to get much more submissions, many more submissions from Asia, Latin America, in Africa, places that have not generally uh, been re -re well researched or studied, but where we think many of the problems have moved to. Well, I think that that we've been the leading journal in this area that's dealt with the issue of corporate influence on science and policy, which is a tremendous problem in the occupational, environmental, and consumer areas. And very few journals have been willing to publish in that area, uh, particularly since most of that, the material needed to get at the truth of what's been going on relies on documents that are not in the public domain, but rather documents that have been uh, released as a result of court cases or lawsuits or, in some cases, criminal cases. And we've been willing to accept study results that companies did, studies that companies did, and the results that they had, which they did not want to publish, and publish those results when they become public. Well, the politics, if there is any, is in the fact that these studies were good studies conducted by companies generally on their own workers or their own products and they were not published for political reasons originally. So the politics is in the non-publication and not the publication. All we're doing is providing a vehicle through which people who get access to the data through the legal process or the public policy debates or submissions to government agencies get to actually publish what was known about the toxicity of different products 
by the people who made those products. In fact, the data's got to be the most, some of the most important valuable data out there since there's no bias interest for a company to find that its product made people sick. It's not in their interest to publish that information, and that's why they don't publish it. But it's certainly not biased data in any way, shape, form, or manner, because it's a, a statement against interest. And a statement against interest is a, is a uh, statement that's usually believable. We're, we're going to be publishing another um, Senate investigation on the Medtronic company and how their product actually injured people um, and how that information was not released to the public until the Senate Investigatory Committee got it. But that published, that paper will consist of a review of actual data that the company had. Asbestos is a good example of what I was talking about before in terms of the difference in how it's been regulated and dealt with in the in the developed world versus the under under or the developing world. Um, it's in fact banned in Europe and strictly regulated in North America, at least North America apart from Mexico. Um, aside from those locations, or in contrast, in India, in Brazil, and even in Japan, it's been widely used and used at levels that are considered way above levels that that were banned in the in the in the West decades ago. And a lot of that use has been based on the promotion of the idea that's not correct that chrysotile asbestos is not hazardous. And the literature that that's used to support that false argument was funded by companies, done by university professors, and now stands as, as the, say, the single leg of a three-legged stool that remains, that is being held up by companies who are promoting the use of chrysotile. And so there's still a need to expose the fraudulent science that's used to promote the use of this deadly material in developing countries. And we've tried to fill that void. Well, in the area of asbestos, I think it's had a clear impact in uh, influencing regulatory agencies in Europe, in the United States, and in fact in Canada, uh, where they just closed the last main mine essentially you stopped exporting asbestos to developing countries. In other areas, I, there's a less direct line towards policy uh, impact, but I think that a lot of the articles that we've, that we've published, including articles especially on how to train workers on, in health and safety directed towards workers in developing countries especially, have been used by people to train workers and to implement health protections based on the studies that show that there's health risk. So a lot of our papers are papers that examine, I think it's one of the areas that we cover that a few other people do cover, the practice part of occupational environmental and consumer health. In other words, we publish on whether hazards exist and how those hazards are identified. But we publish a lot about how to take that information and use it in a practical way. And how to study the impact of various educational and regulatory programs to try to eliminate risk. We've recently added consumer health in, to, the, to the scope of the journal. Basically, what we're doing is following the product from, main, from the raw material to producing a consumer product to look may impact on consumer health. And so we're looking at the whole process chain. We're looking at how the product may 
in injure workers. And usually most products are found to be most dangerous or first found to cause problems in the workers who manufacture the product. And then we're looking at how the product may impact on people who use the product. And that's really not, an, not much of an addition because most of the studies, for example, of asbestos toxicity deal with its toxicity in people who use the product, not in manufacturing workers or in miners of asbestos. The, the largest number of people who were injured by asbestos were consumers. Now, in this case, they weren't home consumers. They were workers who were working with the product in the field. Um, and then following the chain down the line, with asbestos and with other products, it turns out that some particularly toxic dust can injure people at home. And that can happen anywhere along the chain. It can happen when, for example, silica or asbestos is mined and the miners take the product home or lead and they take it home and their children and spouses can get lead poison. Workers who work with the product, lead or silver or asbestos at a factory, can bring that product home so spouses and children of factory workers can get sick. And then consumers who use products, for example, painted with lead paint, can include, can get sick as well. In that case, children are the, generally the target, although some adults can get sick too. So it's not really a change in what we've been doing, but it's a change in our emphasis in terms of trying to solicit more articles that deal with consumer health issues. And to some extent, in terms of topic, it brings us into the area of medical products. And Pete, you know, that's always been part of occupational health because workers who made pills estrogens and others often got sick from exposures to those drugs at work or carcinogens for example which are used as treatment for cancer um, are used by nurses and others in hospitals and they get sick from exposures at work and then to look at the consumer end some consumers in this case cancer patients who are treated with chemotherapy agents get other cancers later on. For example, people with Hodgkin's disease not in occasionally get cancer because of the treatment for the Hodgkin's disease. So there's always been this chain from production to the consumer and we're just emphasizing more the consumer end because in many cases the consumers are the larger volume of people who get sick. In fact, if you look at something like lead, it's few workers mine it, so few could get sick from it. More workers worked with it, and then a lot of people were exposed to it as consumers. It was used as paint, on products, etc. There's been a tendency to not change the way we've approached toxic substances in the workplace and in the consumers. And by that I mean products are assumed to be safe until we find that they've injured people. So the precautionary principle has not been implemented in any major way anyway. And we've tried to have some discussion about a policy change which would, which would force companies to test their products before they decide to make them and certainly before they decide to sell them. The largest example of this going on in a wrong way is nanomaterials. As nanomaterials are in the marketplace now in huge amounts in all kinds of products, beauty products, lipsticks, socks as deodorants, I mean places that people would not normally think they're being exposed to a substance that's never been tested for toxicity. And so we tried from a policy perspective to, to get articles and that we try to force a shift in how we view chemicals and how we view the manufacturing process versus the safety analysis. We think that the safety analysis should come first before the products are manufactured and sold 
rather than the reverse, which has been the historical approach. We also are concerned about workers, worker rights, how workers can be made a more important and more powerful part of the process of dealing with chemicals and the social relations between workers and companies and the communities has been an area that we've tried to encourage papers and have solicited papers and that's a really important and under-researched area in developing countries. We, we have for several years now published the health hazard evaluations from the NIOSH health hazard evaluations group. Now they have, they do all that work, they decide what gets published and submit the abstracts or a little bit longer to us and we publish them. We do that because while NIOSH publishes full reports which are available on the web or if you contact them, when we publish them they get entered into the PubMed system. So they become searchable and available to a much larger community. And if you and this becomes important, for example, with respect to the diacetyl lung disease issue. The first study that actually found bronchiolitis obliterans in people who were exposed to flavorings was done by NIOSH and was in 1968. But nobody knew about it because it was never published as a paper and it wasn't searchable on PubMed. And that was a, a gap in information that might have led to an earlier recognition of the fact that diacetyl caused serious fatal lung disease before we actually figured it out in the early 1990s. So I have a great interest in the idea of prevention versus treatment. Most treatments for most serious diseases, certainly for almost all occupational diseases, are not treatable. But they are all 100% preventable. And it's much more important to prevent a disease than to treat one, even if the treatment works. And so I think that from a satisfaction perspective, although you can't count the number of people who haven't gotten a disease because some regulation went into place, or some education program went into place, or some paper was, was published that showed that what they were working with had, had injured or killed other workers. That's a tremendous silent majority that can be relieved of a burden of disease, and there's no other way to do it. In the future, I think I'd like to see the journal start to do abstracts in Hindi and Chinese so that the um, articles could be made available. I mean, Hindi and Chinese covers right away almost a billion and a half more people and who can read, would be able to read at least the idea of the journal and then get the articles and get translations if they thought that the material was relevant to them. Also, we'd like to focus on getting more articles from Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And we, we are, we've been working with some medical schools in those areas, developing uh, an interest interest in occupational environmental health and hopefully that will down the line result in more papers, research papers and, and policy changes in those countries that we can then publish and report on.